Hello there, I'm Mikko from the Body of Christ and welcome to another Leadership Reflection. Today our topic is authority in leadership especially and authority is a, a favorite subject of mine or one of those because it is so very important especially to the Body of Christ. It's very important to know your authority and how authority works. And first thing to know is that authority is no magic. It's not some something like charisma, you know, that you kind of play yourself into. It is very like fundamental. Um, I think there are kind of two kinds of authority: those that come above, like something that are, that is given to you by a superior force. Uh, assigning some of his authority to you. It's also maybe called delegated authority. And then there's also the situation of someone else uh, committing themselves under your authority. So today we'll be probably focusing more on this one here. And I wanted to start with the scripture. This is from Matthew chapter 8, uh, verse 9. So this is a little bit of con context. Uh, Jesus received a note from the Jews that, or notice from the Jews that there was a centurion whose servant was sick and Jesus was going there to heal him. But the centurion sent servants and those servants uh, delivered him this message. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shalt come under my roof. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For, for I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth. And Jesus, of course, reacted very positively to this, to this man's faith. He didn't say, but I think that would imply, that his understanding was correct, even in the spiritual realm of the kingdom of God. So what I wanted to focus there was that what it says here, I am a man under authority and have soldiers under me. So there's like in this example, there's three layers. There's one, two, and three. And you're the number two. Well, this centurion here was the number two layer of authority. Of course, this can go on indefinitely, but in this case, three layers were introduced. And um, I think there's a misconception about leadership and authority, and really ignorance about authority in this matter. Uh, but let me explain what it is. Often we think of leadership as something like this. So that would be, if you're the leader, here, that would be, I am a leader and have soldiers under me. So that's the number one perception. And the other way around, of course, is the same. Let's say you're this one. Let's not focus so much on your peers. And here, you're the follower. And your position is, I follow a leader. But neither of those matches what's demonstrated here. Because what's demonstrated here is I am a leader under authority, so under a leader's leader, and I lead a team, so I have soldiers. And what that means in terms of authority is that this leader here has given him some of his authority so that he can operate in it. And with that authority, he then commands these soldiers. So he has been given the authority to command these soldiers. And possibly he can delegate some of that authority here so that they can have authority and lead. Uh, but let's focus here for a while on these more dysfunctional examples or traditional, I guess. Here, uh, if we go with this sort of... Uh, do this, do that, micromanagement leader kind of example here. That's uh, drawing a bit of an exaggeration, but try to make a point here. So uh, 
Let's start with this. So let's say this leader here, let's call him Keijo again, okay? <laughs> Nothing against Keijos. Um, and, but he refuses to give authority to his followers. And let's go here later, but, but he doesn't yield or commit his authority to his followers. So instead what happens is that every decision that has to be made, he makes it. Every major thing he decides and everything revolves around his ability. And these are really like little helper, oops, oops. <laughs> little helpers here that just do busy work for Keir because he hasn't committed his authority, his ministry, his power to these followers. And within normal circumstances, he thinks he's leading, but really he's not operating really in, in authority. And another perspective we could take is that maybe he hasn't even received authority from anywhere. So not here. So maybe he's just, uh, I don't know, a business leader that happens to operate by his position. Of course, that gives him some authority, even in, in terms of the national civil law. But um, what's more important to understand, even if you're dealing with businesses, but especially when you're dealing with the kingdom of God, is that we are under authority. So that means... We can't do anything we want to do. We have to follow God. And God's the leader. And God has given us some of his authority to operate in our calling, in our giftings, in our position, intended position in the body of Christ. But uh, we make that choice. And if we act out of line with a reasonable amount of grace applied, or mercy, I guess, um, we go out of position here then God has the ability to revolt that authority if it's in terms of calling. And even then, you know, there's scripture that callings and gifts are without repentance. So not sure if this applies, but um, you can imagine some other situation where this could apply, probably. But the thing is, our authority is related to this position. And actually, let's take another example from the Bible. Uh, there were these, what's they called? Um, those who cast out spirits with a fancy Catholic name, like exorcists. Yeah, those guys. Um, and they met this spirit guy here, okay, and this demonized person. And what they said to this demonized person was that we command you to go away in the name of the Jesus that Paul preaches. And what they were doing is that they were bluffing authority. So here's God and Jesus. And, of, and they could have had authority if they were a member of the body of Christ and, and Christ had delegated his superior authority to them. But they did not have a relationship with Christ. They were not submitted to Christ really. They were just using his name. So uh, they did a bluff, but the demon called out the bluff and the demonized guy came and, and beat them up. So um, that to me demonstrates a little bit how authority functions in the body of Christ, that it is a relationship. It requires this submit submittance to the higher power, in this case, Jesus, in order to function. These guys didn't have it. So similarly, if you, as a born-again believer or whatever, a Christian, um, like renounce or neglect this relationship here, um, how can you be sure about the authority? If you're not yourself submitted to Christ, then how could he... Uh, how could you operate in his authority? It's a question for you. Might be that you can. Pretty interesting to hear. Um, but that requires kind of submitting. And let's take the other other end here. So 
this example. Let's take a new page because we are running low on space. So now let's say you're a follower here and you haven't understood authority yet. So what you expect is that this leader here has all the authority and he's not about to delegate it to these little helper guys because you've, you've been grown up in this dysfunctional leadership style where, for example, a teacher teaches and, and the students just sit and watch, not talking about this, obviously. <laughs> well, uh, this is kind of enforced by the technology we're using. But... Um, but what happens here if you're not expecting to uh, wield authority, delegate authority that means you're not really being proactive you're not taking steps of faith you're not making things happen by yourself but you're always coming back to the leader with your questions oh leader, how should we do this? oh leader, how should we do that? should I do this? should I do that? Bada 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 bada. you know bunch of details and micro stuff um, that the leader is actually not equipped to handle. The leader is equipped, if he's a functional leader, he's equipped to handle macro stuff, the bigger vision. He's not an expert in the stuff that you're doing. At least he's not supposed to be. And you're supposed to grow and actually help him, not to kind of go to him and ask for everything. But this happens easily if you don't understand authority, that you have been given authority, and especially that you're supposed to lead, actually. So obviously it's impossible to lead if you don't assume authority yourself, if you don't receive it. So this kind of misunderstanding creates a passive set of followers, kind of weak. Uh, these guys who just look up to the leader to do everything. Like, I wonder when he's going to remind us to do stuff. Or like, uh, I wonder when he's going to send that invitation to the meeting. And, you know, he's going to do the decisions and everything. Kind of all the pressure goes to this, this leader guy here. So, but when you understand authority and you understand that you have been given, let's assume again that you're working under functional leader. You've been given authority here then you take that part into yourself in the sense that it becomes part of your identity. Like you, you say, I am a leader. And you believe that, you understand it, you understand your calling. Let's say you're a leader in uh, spiritual warfare operations of your church. Now, what happens? If you're wise, you want to delegate that authority to your followers here. Because alone you cannot do much, but together with your with your people you can do a lot. So maybe you delegate this. Hey, your authority is in the defense. You're the defensive general, whatever, and you you're the territorial, whatever leader, and you're here as a support backup, and you're supposed to lead teams. So each of you, I'm expecting you to lead a team. And here's the authority to do that. And what's that authority based? It's based on your authority, which is based on the leader's authority, which is based on that leader's authority, and so on and so forth. One thing I'd like to point also is it's important what the authority is based on. So let's have a chain of commands, so to speak, here. This is... Uh, Sequence of delegated authority. Now, the question, of course, is what is this guy's authority based on? And in case, let's say, a civil government. Just one example. Let's say here is you. Here is your employer. Here is the tax, what's it called, you know, the internal revenue service guys <laughs> uh, so IRS and here's the government itself like the what's it called you know the guys that sit in their chairs and do nothing um, so 
what is this authority based on? Well, in my perspective, it's based on a spiritual principality whose authority is based on the kingdom of Satan, whose our authority is not based on God because he doesn't have a relationship with God anymore. So that's where the authority ends. And that's all the power they can wield. They can, like, and that's the maximum assumed authority here, okay? Not necessarily dealing with spiritual principalities if they're unspiritual leaders. But uh, let's say, you know, your employer, they have just that much authority because they've been given just that much authority. But obviously, this sequence of authority cannot wield anything greater than Satan himself can if they're not submitted to anything bigger than Satan. Of course, another sequence of authorities is God the Father, Jesus Christ, let's say your leader, let's say you here and your followers here. Now, what is this authority cycle based on? It is the based on the power of God, which is inherent in him as a creation, creator of everything. So he is a superior being, even more superior than this loser here. Uh, and through the process of creation, he has superior authority over everything. That's my opinion. You can disagree and, and argue about that and actually share your thoughts about that as well in the comments. That would be interesting. But anyway, the maximum amount of power that can be wielded is total power. <laughs> because Jesus said, I've been given all power in heaven and in earth. That means everything, 100% power. Or, you know, Paul would argue maybe that it's 99.999% because Father left him outside of that pile. But that's technical matter. That doesn't matter practice because they're one so so maximum power is all power that's pretty good right and depending on the calling and position of your leader and what's the plan God's plan for his life he has received some authority but that potentially can be so much more than these guys have because of this infinite potential so to speak I don't like you use that word too much, but there you go. So, and understanding that when you're operating in this authority sequence, the organization and the name you represent, like Doris Exorcist said, in the name of Jesus, that means they, although like not really, they were just bluffing, but they technically could have been representing the actual power of Christ through the name of Christ. So the name of Christ power sequence, whatever, is so, so much greater than this name of spiritual principality, name of Finland, name of United States, whatever, power. These are superiorly inferior. <laughs> That's a funny word. Powers. But again, none of this matters if you don't operate like this centurion did, understanding that you're a man under authority and you have soldiers under you. So if you're if you're this let's say this follower and you don't receive authority from a leader, then it doesn't matter how much authority Jesus has on earth for you or your operation because you're not operating it. You're not perceiving that. Or it's, um, see, your leader is not receiving that. So here would be Jesus, but no, he's not doing that. So then you can receive authority from Jesus, which then supersedes your authority and this leader, or you don't have it either. So again, doesn't help. Even if you have, if you're even if you're operating under your leader, and this is the case 
uh, with civil governments, for example, with civil employees, employers, uh, say employer or government. It doesn't help if you're a man under authority and you have soldiers under you, if that authority system gaps here. I mean, it helps someone, but it's not the same. And uh, let's say you receive authority here, but if you don't commit authority to others, like Paul said uh, to Timothy, like find good people that are so-and-so and so-and-so, and so and so can not remember right now, sorry about that, but good people apt to teach, teach others also, or who are apt to teach others also, and commit to them this, whatever I have said unto you. So everything I taught you, commit this to them. So it doesn't stay with you, it doesn't die with you, it doesn't get limited with you. So let's say, before you're operating in a team, or with a team, all you can do is operate in yourself. You can go to the street corner, you can preach, you can hand out tracks, um, you can, what else can you do? I don't know, go as a politician or something. You know, these little things. But when you start leading and leading in a functional way, committing your authority here to these guys, then, like, let's say you had that spiritual warfare ministry. Alone, you would be praying in your closet. And that's powerful. That's powerful, okay? Not saying it's not. Because God hears some prayers, God answers, God's mighty. But how much more powerful is it when you commit to that to others and you lead them and you help them to see the bigger picture? And you actually give authority to them and they receive it and they can distribute it forward. This means that you can actually, you with these people, can actually operate a large function in the body of Christ. Like the whole spiritual warfare operations in your nation, for example. That's possible with this understanding of the authority with functional leadership. So this is big. But both of these have to happen. You we, you will have none of your spiritual warfare, national operations, if Jesus is not here. And if this chain is not functioning, then nothing will happen. All you can do is maybe have a political movement. Yeah, good for you. But if Jesus is here, chain is effective. You're, deleg you're receiving and delegating authority. My things can happen to you, through you and to you, of course. But that's kind of what I want to challenge you with, is maybe to think a little bit more of yourself and a little bit less of yourself. <laughs> uh, and what I mean is that you may be thinking, oh, I'm not anything, you know, I'm a little worm in the earth. Why would I have any authority? Well, it's not about who you are. It's about who is here, Jesus. And it's about receiving something that he has given you. It's, it's not about your status, your potential, your power. You might be a worm, okay? But you're an anointed worm. So act on it. I guess that's everything I wanted to share with you today about this. Um, I think this is worthy of reflection, this idea and this thought. And really, we need the body of Christ to operate in our God-given authority, recognize our callings, act on them, go for the like mission, go the, for the vision that Jesus has for the church, because the harder times are coming, but also bigger victories are coming for the body of Christ question is are you part of that or are you know are you functioning in this sequence or are you doing something else with your time anyway i hope to hear your thoughts contact me in through the comments or otherwise let's discuss these things more and see you in the next leadership reflection